Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. As I'm Mark Marquette saying, it never gets old talking about Apollo 11 and man on the moon. As we're glad that you're with us to stay curious. And we're going to talk, we being Marty Winkle, my co-producer. And he worked on the lunar module right there in the photos of a newspaper, 54 years old today. The... Uh, the, the Florida Today paper there. And uh, Marty, uh, good to have you on board. 54 years ago, he was happy that this event happened as a Grumman electrical engineer. Eagle flies again. I love that headline, Marty, on the star advocate of the Titusville newspaper. And you, as we've talked a lot about you being involved with the lunar modules, uh, uh, hello to you. Would you comment that uh, everybody was told to uh, the landing was not the the big moment for you guys? This was correct. Well, the landing was. We didn't celebrate until we landed on the moon, and then we kind of celebrated again <clears throat> when we lifted off the moon and and docked with the command module. Then your lunar module had done its job of, of, of ferrying human beings to the moon and back, still the only vehicle to ever do that. And bring back this booty of rocks here. About 54 pounds of rocks were brought back by the Apollo astronauts. We're going to talk today about some of the, the, the media stars of the day that were involved with the mission control. Who got the Emmy Award? ABC, NBC, or CBS for the Apollo 11 coverage. I'm going to tell you that. There's a cool movie called The Dish that uh, relives some of the drama of how we almost did not get the moon uh, landing video live, the moonwalk. So uh, hope you all enjoy some of that today. But uh, also want to remind you that you can watch Apollo real time live. Uh, on this uh, website, it's really cool to watch things or go back and watch the whole thing again if you want. Uh, a lot of us at the museum have been watching it off and on. Um, and over the years that we've done Stay Curious, Marty, people have asked me, you know, why do you want to do it almost every day? We do it five days a week. Well, because there's always history going on every day of the year. And today we've got some interesting space history that I'm just going to briefly touch on. Of course, Mercury Redstone 4 was launched with Gus Grissom on his famous suborbital flight on July 21st, 1961. Uh, of course, famous for the hatch blowing out and losing the capsule. Gus was almost drowned, quite frankly, when his suit filled up with air, with air, with water. Uh, Nick Thomas, uh, our good friend now and astronaut wrangler at Kenny Visitors Complex, had a great show on that uh and you can look that up on our website not our website on youtube all right uh important about this mission of gus was that uh, it was a little different than vehicle than shepherds and alan shepherds because it had a trapezoidal window in it uh and uh the uh vehicles on has been on display at the kansas cosmosphere in hutchinsville kansas so uh, that was going on in space history in 1961. In 1966, on July 21st, was the landing of Apollo 10 with uh, Mike Collins, who was coming back from the moon. All right, on the uh, and so he was actually the same in space on both of his space flights on July 20, 20th, and 21st. Uh, how cool is that? Of course, his commander uh, was John Young on that flight of, Ge of uh, Gemini 10, an important spacewalk that Collins did that people forget about. The Apollo-Soyuz test project was going on, Marty, at this same time in 1975, and the Soyuz spacecraft returned to Earth while Apollo remained in orbit uh, for three and a half more days with Stafford, uh, Tom Stafford, Slayton, and Vance Brand on board. By the way, Vance Brand and Tom Stafford are still around. Uh, in their 90s, and we'll try to do a program Tuesday on their landing on that. And then on this date in 1998, Alan Shepard, America's first man in space and the Apollo 14 moonwalker, actually are returned to flight after Apollo 13 landing on the moon. He died at age 75 after a two-year battle with leukemia. So uh, there's a little bit of space history that it all gets mired up in the hoopla of man on the moon for the first time 
And you're right, I can't talk enough about it, but today, uh, on a very busy Friday, lazy in some ways, I got my Florida shirt on here, uh, but a lot of fun in a lot of ways to put this program together. As last night, I was watching three or four hours, actually, of documentaries on this the, the Story Channel about different aspects of Apollo 11, and saw a great biography of Neil Armstrong, and then it talked about the aftermath of, of it and some other things that I thought would be interesting to share with you all today. Starting off with the control room, Gene Krantz there, nonchalantly, there on the left with his white vest. Of course, known more famously for the Apollo 13 as the flight director in the movie Apollo 13. Well, three other flight directors shown here, Glenn Lunny, Gerald Griffin, and Clifford Charlesworth in the back. Uh, they rotated shifts, uh, the four of them, to cover the mission. But Gene Krantz is the most well-known, and he was sort of a general patent. Uh, approach to the whole thing, particularly after the Apollo 1 fire, when he said, you're going to write on the chalkboard, uh, oh, what were the two things uh, 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 that he said to write on the chalkboard in his speech? Determination and, and, and uh, uh, it escapes me, but uh, we needed that kind of attitude. And Gene Krantz said, Apollo 11 was the battleground with Russia for the minds and hearts of the free world. He took this mission as we won the moon race against uh, uh, the, the communist Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, So, uh, as you see, he looks a little different in there. Most of the controllers had short sleeve white shirts and black thin ties on them. Okay. Except for, oh, there's Gene there. Build up to that. Uh, again, there's Gene Krantz eating some fried chicken or something at the console. That is an IT guy's nightmare, <laughs> okay, to be eating where you work, Marty. But as I was building up there, all the astronauts and techs had white shirts, thin black ties in there, except for Deke Slayton, the, the chief of the astronauts. He always had that bronze colored. A collarless polo shirt and boy is he chain smoking like crazy in the movie in the the videos you see with charlie duke who was the capcom and telling him you know you had us about to turn blue in our in the face and when they landed the, the astronauts there's jim lovell fred hayes is there uh several others they were like uh wanted to clap and stuff and and uh boy uh uh, Deke Slayton calms him down there in, in the movie. Marty, you got a question. <clears throat> Excuse me, you got a comment from uh, uh, Doug Forrest. Those two words was tough and competent. Thanks, Doug. Tough and competent. Appreciate that. He knows his space history there. He's uh, sharpening up that number four pencil to outline some of his creations there he might be doing. An excellent pencil. Yeah, tough and competent. competent. He had to be tough, Gene Krantz said. We couldn't, you know, uh, you had to ask the tough questions. The the lower echelon people had to be competent. And 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 yet, uh, if you saw something wrong after the Apollo 1 fire, everyone raised their uh, suspicions about it. So thank you for those words there. Well, part of what I enjoyed uh, watching yesterday was a little bit about the communication systems that you didn't think too much about particularly on the moon, the astronauts had an antenna, and the antenna had to go to the VHF uh, voice data to the antenna that Marty's familiar with. Then you had the VHF uh, S-band antenna communicating the data, the S-band antenna communicating data to the Earth, while the VH connection went up to the command module when it was going over for about 10, 15 minutes every two hours. Uh, so you have quite a, a, a big uh, situation going there uh, right on the lunar surface to get your voice off as well as the video. And then the TV signal sent from the moon to Earth to three important places. Goldstone Tracking Facility in the Mojave Desert in California and then the Parks and Honeysuckle Creek radar dishes in Australia. And uh, these are the, uh, uh, the real heroes, maybe, of the communications that as you try to watch it, I say try, as you're watching the Apollo reel uh, you know, on the website, 
sometimes it's hard to because of all the static in in the transmission and boy marty these guys with headsets on that whole time listen to that static and that transmission to hear the astronaut squeaky voices in there you that that had to give you a headache after a while well uh honeysuckle tracking station particularly is featured in the movie uh the dish but these were other tracking station locations goldstone madrid was one in spain honeysuckle there was a one outside of canberra uh, called uh, uh, Tidbintala, Tidbintala, and then uh, the Parkes Telescope in there. So Australia played a big role in this, and as is shown in this movie, The Dish, a big storm was going on. And that's uh, Sam Neill there to the right uh, that, that you remember from Jurassic Park movies, and Patrick Warburton there. He's been on a lot of TV sitcoms. Uh, uh, was uh, on Seinfeld, was Elaine's boyfriend at one time, and uh, he's he's pretty well known. Tom Long, Kevin Harrington are in this movie. That this promoted the first step on the moon, nearly stumbled on Earth. That's because of the dish. Um, it was actually moving around in this gigantic storm. Here's another publicity of it. The the dish is in the middle of a sheep uh, herd up there. So. A fun movie and inspired human comedy, says the tagline there. I think I may watch it over the weekend uh, and just kind of end my frenzy of Apollo 11 with this pretty cool movie. But there was a lot that could have gone wrong that we wouldn't have even gotten uh, all of the uh, t uh, video of that two-hour moonwalk that happened. And also, the uh, we actually, when we saw it in America, it was like looking at the third Xerox copy of something uh, it had been filtered down for various reasons uh, mainly to expedite it being on air well uh, so we hope that you can enjoy some of that uh, over the weekend as we give our post apollo 11 hangover well of course the television coverage here uh, with uh, uh, wally shira as the sidekick to walter cronkite on cbs Basically, Marty, you can say this about Apollo 11 was the greatest single broadcast in television history. Name me something since that has captivated not just America, but the entire world. Uh, of, uh, of course, 9-11 is a pretty big uh, one to stand up against it. But particularly at the time, the greatest single broadcast in television history that may have, have, have you know been eclipsed by the attack on america but the mesmerizing television coverage of apollo 11 moon landing 54 years ago brought previously unthinkable images and ideas into the homes of millions leaving a profound impact on pop pop culture in the american psyche when the eagle spacecraft touched down on the moon's surface july 20th 1969 a television camera mounted on the side captured the first tentative steps and words of neil armstrong sent to uh, 250,000 miles across space to pairs, just millions and millions of eyes glued to television sets. Uh, Walter Cronkite, who was sort of the dean of the astronauts at the time, was uh, initially left speechless. Eventually he managed to exclaim, man, on the moon, oh boy, whoo, boy. And beside him, Wally Shira wiped a tear away. And then they held up this this uh, uh, quick uh, daily news uh, that was obviously a TV prop. But look at Wally's face there, Marty, as he wiped a tear away before that. And who knows what he was thinking about. He had been through it all uh, and uh, had lost his three best friends in the Apollo 1 fire. And just, uh, just uh, incredible what he might have been thinking at the time. Uh, later, Cronkite recalled... Uh, what he'd hoped to say something more profound, but uh, he said that was all I could utter. I was just flat flabbergasted. Uh, well, he was known as the most trusted man in America, Cronkite was, and he was on the air for 27 of the 30 hours uh, of, of uh, broadcast that CBS did. This was wall to wall in the middle of the night. They would be talking, talking to anyone that would talk to them. Simulations were going on. They had backdrops. They had uh, uh, some of the Grumman test astronauts were involved on all the news uh, stations on there. Um, 
but uh, uh, Cronkite went from the most trusted man in America to Old Iron Pants was the nickname they gave him after missing just three hours of, in a cat nap of the 30 hours at CBS broadcast. And at the end, he said July 20th will be remembered as the moon landing day for as long as man survives. All right. Well, everybody loved Uncle Walt's coverage, but uh, if you needed in-depth hard news, you may have flipped over to ABC to get uh, Jules Bergman and Frank Reynolds. Frank Reynolds on the left and Jules Bergman there on the right. And they've got a Tang ad right there on their set, Marty, which really upset Florida orange growers, okay? They, they really made a stink about this because, you know, Florida, where we launched the moonship, Brevard County, you know, the birthplace of the space age. And as we say on and on, it's our delivery room here of the America Space Age and the America Space Museum. And they've got Tang <laughs> on there uh, constantly for hours and hours up there. So uh, Jules Bergman was uh, talked to, of course, the late Hugh Harris. Uh, we were going to do a whole program about that. And I feel cheated that when I was thinking about last night, what I was going to do on today's show for Apollo 11, I thought, boy, it had been a no-brainer to have uh, Hugh Harris on and talk about how her personally he knew all of these people, uh, newscasters. And Jules Bergman, he told me, definitely uh, had a big ego. So did Walter Cronkite. All news people do, uh, including those that have been in the news, uh, like myself. Jules Bergman, uh, though, was really known for his deep uh, into the scientific inside of things and and would uh, try to trip people up all the time. Uh, but uh, you needed that uh, in there. The NBC, CBS, ABC, and NBC were the three biggies at the time. That was the only way you're going to get your news, all right? And they only broadcast in the evening for a half an hour. NBC had that morning program, but Jay Barbary covered every human launch at Kennedy Space Center from Alan Shepard to uh, the uh, uh, STS-135. Uh, he saw the return to flight from his own home uh, a year or so before he died, but he was a friend of the museum, wrote a book about Neil Armstrong. But Jay Barbary's coverage in the entire NBC news staff Here's another picture of Jay there. They won the Emmy. And those of us baby boomers out there, I would have guessed Walter Cronkite and CBS would have won the Emmy for the coverage of Apollo 11, but NBC actually won it. Uh, and uh, not CBS or ABC with Jules Bergman and Frank Reynolds. So little known fact about that, but what a heyday it was to watch these guys. And like uh, I mentioned, Millions and millions of Americans had no idea what LOR meant, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, or what uh, uh, a lunar module looked like. Why did it look like a spider and was so abstract in its angles and so forth? Uh, the command module, why, would, why, why don't you make it bigger to hold, uh, you know, why, why are you so cramped in there and so forth? Uh, all this was, was told to us over and over again uh, on the... Uh, uh, the uh, this this wall to wall broadcast of Apollo 11. Well, part of the news drama of the day <clears throat> when Apollo 11 was launched on July, uh, Jan July 16th, the Russians had launched a propaganda ploy to beat us there with the Luna 15 spacecraft shown on the right. They wanted it to land in Mercrisium. Up there, the oval that you're going to see tonight when you see the crescent moon and the Apollo 11 landing site will be about right on the Terminator tonight, the difference between night and day on the moon. Nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Terminator, get it? Well, the Soviet Union launched a space probe that was eventually successful, uh, uh, not this one, but uh, Luna 16 and 17 were, where they brought back in that scoop on the far right about two ounces of lunar rock and soil. Uh, but it was being monitored on the way. It was when Apollo 11 was in orbit, it was a, to, to land, and it tried to land, and it crashed. How do we know that? Thanks to this man. Sir Bernard Lovell, who died at age 98 in 2012, 
All you baby boomers, you're familiar with Jodrell Bank, all right, near Godsfree, Cheshire, in northeast England, all right? And I know Robert Law is like going, I've been there, I've been there. Well, enjoy your cocktail and calm down, Robert, okay? I'm, I'm sure you've been there, and one day you can bring us pictures and talk about it. But this guy and his whole team intercepted Russian communications, all right, with this radio dish behind you. So they monitored a lot of the Soviet uh, crewed missions, a lot of their lunar missions, so missions to Venus, and uh, um, otherwise the uh, Western world would not have known this because Russia wanted to be, uh, do their programs in secrecy so they could only talk about their successes and nobody know about their failures. Well, thanks to Jodrell Bank, we knew that this was on the way and that it had failed. Well, now to the rocks that we have behind us here and the Lunar Receiving Lab shown here, the LRL, its functional areas you had there, of course, the administrative area, you've got an operations area, barriers throughout there, the samples are in the back, radiation containment areas there. And this was the hub where the astronauts went, okay, to be in quarantine. The Apollo 11 rocks uh, contain the first geological samples of the moon, okay, uh, uh, about 70 pounds of, of material, including 50 rocks, and they had some fine-grained lunar regolith that, that Neil had just scooped in at the last minute with his hands because he said the box looked kind of empty. Uh, and they also pound a couple core, to set, core, core samples into the ground uh, about uh, two feet below the moon's surface, and uh, uh, they contained no water and provided no evidence for living organisms at any time in the moon's history. All right. Now, as we look at the moon rocks here, let me see where I'm at. Okay. When those moon rocks were brought to the lunar receiving lab, and let me show you that elaborate picture. And we'll look at that in a second, how, how all this came together. Uh, there are the Apollo 11 box of rocks coming in there. And standing in front of them are the are the VIPs. Uh, you got uh, uh, in the right hand picture. You've got NASA managers George Lowe, left to right, Sam Phillips, Tom Payne, Robert Gilruth. They're standing in front of the first containers of boxes there. You know, and I wonder if they kicked them a little bit there to see how heavy they were, Marty. But a big day where all the muckety mucks, as um, some people like to call them. We're there at the uh, Lunar Receiving Lab for the big day to get just not the rocks, but the folded up solar experiment that looked like a piece of aluminum foil on a, on a, a, on a flag post was up there. And uh, so what kind of rocks do we have there? Oh, here's, here's how they all got there. Uh, oh, let's go. Transportation to and from. There you got the aircraft carrier. Okay, Hornet. And they brought the lunar samples directly in the film and everything right from the aircraft carrier to the lunar receiving lab. 50 specimens were there, uh, probably including their bodily fluids and so forth. And then they flew the, the astronauts to Hawaii, and then they flew them from Hawaii to uh, an air transport van, three astronauts, a medic, and a technician, as you see there. Uh, so uh, the spacecraft came... Uh, uh, surface and air in the sealed okay and then the specimens of lunar rock uh, were a few months later distributed more to 50 universities and laboratories around the world all right so tight-knit situation there but when we talk about the rocks and here's some people working on those rocks uh, and and they're still working on them they kept some of the rocks from the Apollo era, Marty, uh, boxed up for 50 years or more, right? We've got six samples, Apollo 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Some of them they didn't even touch for 50 years. Why? Well, because scientists know that in a 50-year period, there will be created instruments 
better than what they're working with now to analyze these rocks. So they wanted to save some in pristine conditions so the next generation of equipment and better ways of looking at things. And look at it this way. X-rays were a big deal in the 1960s, all right? Nobody heard of magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, all right? Uh, so, M so that is the change from X-rays to MRIs where you see a 3D uh, image of a human body or other objects, including moon rocks now. All right, what I wanted to point out, just a little bit of science for everybody, is about these rocks. There are three types of rocks on the moon. Breccias, B-R-E-C-C-I-A-S, that are compo composed of older rocks kind of fused together. Basalts, basalts are solidified molten lava. Basalts are rocks from volcanoes or magma and then the lunar highland rocks these are light colored called anthracites which are made up of a mineral plagioclase okay and uh and that is important because there's not much plagioclase on earth so what they found on apollo 11 quickly you say that's ah, a box of rocks we spent 40 billion dollars of american taxpayer money from the apollo era and 1960s money what good was it? Well, one of the major scientific findings of the Apollo 11 mission was that a small but important fragments of the moon's highland crust were found in some of the Apollo 11 breccias and were interpreted as evidence for an early magma ocean on the moon, all right, on the surface of the moon. It was prior to the lunar landing, some scientists thought the moon might have always been a cold, undifferentiated body. But the discovery of the basalt, which was once molten magma, and the, uh, br uh, uh, the evidence of these fragments of uh, plagioclase in them proved that the moon was once molten and disproved the hypothesis of a cold moon. So that was clicked off the charts there. So um, that's all I'm going to say about the, the science of the rocks. But... Uh, that will certainly make for a good Stay Curious program down the line, won't it? And I love this picture, Marty, as we're looking at the Apollo 11 astronauts in quarantine, all right? And uh, we'll explain that in a minute. This is in their leisurely quarantine at the leisure receiving lab where they were uh, uh, taken, interviewed on the other side of glass and so forth. But here they are looking at the actual film uh, reels. Uh, uh, don't touch it there. Buzz, he's touching the negative or, or positives there. Tom Usiak and I are going crazy. He's leaving fingerprints on these. Uh, what they did once they processed the film, which could you imagine that, Tommy Usiak, uh, the the stress of making sure your machine was the right temperature and that the cog wheels wouldn't stop and and all that is. Uh, and they may have done even some of it by hand, uh, which is easy to do. But uh, these were duplicated immediately. They, they, they immediately made copy slides and put the originals away. Uh, copy negatives and so forth were made right face to face off of these uh, so that the originals could be preserved. And then later they were digitized and, and enhanced, all right, in a way. So um, uh, there's a, the boys looking at that. Thought that's an interesting uh, lead in to their bio. Uh, isolation suits that here's an unusual picture of them just getting into the isolation chamber obviously someone that took that picture is going to stay in there with them this was in the um, uh, uh, airstream that was on the aircraft carrier where we all saw them get in uh, the biohazard uh, yeah at the time there they are outside of those suits now in the airstream looking at their wives uh, Marty, back in 1969, kind of thought it was silly to put him in these hazmat type of uh, uh, crude hazmat uh, outfits there. Uh, but, uh, boy, after 2020 in a real pandemic, uh, we see that what that was a very prudent and cautious thing to do was to quarantine the astronauts as well as have them not expose any moon germs to the atmosphere. So they put them in these suits. Uh, with that filter and their mask there to breathe out of. They were quarantined until August 11th, all right? So they landed, um, I think, August 24th or 25th, quarantined for three weeks till August 11th. And then when they were let out, 
holy mackerel it was called the great leap all right there they there the guys are inside there in quarantine in that airstream when it was uh uh airlifted to the uh outside of houston um quarantine facility Luna receiving lab Neil, of course, reading the newspaper. They probably just enjoyed reading and reading and reading anything about that wasn't about them. Uh, this is coolly set up at the uh, uh, U.S. Rocket Center in Huntsville where they have uh, the Apollo 12 quarantine trailer. And uh, you can see they had a Scrabble board inside of it. And this kind of looks roomy in there. It's not. It's very small in there. Marty, a question or comment? I've got a question excuse me from uh charlotte uh, zan is there evidence that moon being cut half i don't understand this question maybe you do is, is what is there evidence that moon being cut half evidence of the moon being cut in half yeah uh no no evidence of the moon being uh cut in half in fact there is evidence that the earth may have been cut in half or part of it by an impact from a Mars-sized object that ripped the moon out of our Pacific Ocean, so to speak. It's not uh, cut in half, though. But it was not cut in half. I said it was, uh, but the moon was not cut in half in, 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 in any way. And uh, this is one of the theories that the moon rocks have brought back is there's not heavy iron and heavy elements like are on Earth there. So it may have been ripped out of the Earth's mantle during the early days when the Earth was still a molten lava thing. But we still need to know more about it. Sally, thanks for the question there. And that's why Artemis is going back to the moon. All right. Well, wonder what song old Neil's playing there on his ukulele that's got Mike Collins holding his ears <laughs> there. And uh, it's cool that Mike uh, rocked a mustache for a while after that. There you see Buzz in the background talking to somebody on the phone through the window there. But, yep, Neil Armstrong played a ukulele, and he played it in quarantine there. Um, and then the world tour began, all right? In this world tour, trying to advance, there we go. This world tour began in New York City, and it was more surreal than Beatlemania when the Beatles invaded America in February 1964. And for Neil Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins circling the globe for President Nixon was more demanding than flying to the moon. The World Tour was nicknamed the Giant Leap by NASA, and it began September 29, 1969 in Mexico City. The, uh, the astronauts uh, had been back from the moon just nine weeks and were sent on this grueling 27-city, 24-countries in 39-day tour with their wives, all right? And uh, after a ticker tape parade in New York City and I think then Chicago, the Daily News called it Astro Alley, all right? And, Marty, there was so much ticker tape that uh, I saw movies of this, videos yesterday, that the astronauts were actually taking it and scooping it out and tossing it out of their, their convertible because it was filling it up. I couldn't find any pictures of that. And there were a couple motorcycle, motorcade, that had to stop because their wheels had got tangled up in so much ticker tape. It was an incredible way for New Yorkers in those skyscrapers to get rid of their trash, all right? They just literally threw anything out the windows of these gigantic sky crap, sky, uh, 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 skyscrapers. Uh, not sure if it was 6th Avenue or 5th Avenue, but one of those two thoroughfares became that in the canyons of the skyscrapers. Marty, you have a comment or question? Yeah, Doug Forrest said uh, the picture showing Neil playing was taken by Don Blair, who did the radio show from the carrier during the recovery events. All right. Thanks for that trivia there. have to include that next year's show there, Doug. Thank you. Well, something that didn't happen that I saw at the theater was Indiana Jones running through the Apollo 11 parade. And that was about as implausible as most of that Indiana Jones movie, uh, which was called the 
uh, Dial of Destiny, the final installment of that. And it's good. I'm not going to pan it. It was true to the incredible things that could never happen in real life, like Indiana Jones running through the uh, parade of Apollo 11 in 1969 there. So... Uh, but here is the world tour. I look for a color shot. I've seen one of Neil with this uh, 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 in Mexico City with the sombrero on and so forth. Uh, but in this uh, documentary that I saw, it was really cool that they pointed out that Neil Armstrong hated stuff like this. So did Buzz. And so did uh, uh, Collins. They really they didn't disdain publicity, but when they were asked to do it, they did it as best as they could their mission they 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 just wore it like like their their moon suits and and uh, though neil and mike collins enjoyed some relative obscurity in their lives uh private lives uh, buzz of course uh got even more famous uh, as he's gotten older and and uh, though the other two gentlemen have passed away buzz is 93 years old i didn't see his twitter post yesterday i'm sure he was over the moon with thinking 54 years ago, that was me, that everyone's going to always remember that image, that iconic visor shot on there. So um, they traveled with their wives, support staff from NASA and the U.S. State Department, as well as two staffers from the United States Information Agency and four from the Voice of America. No U.S. reporters were permitted to join the tour. Uh, President Nixon had given them a plane from the presidential fleet, Air Force Two typically used by Vice President Agnew. Uh, and uh, some of the people they visited, well, of course, they visited the Queen of England, who just passed away. They visited Pope Paul VI in the Vatican. They visited the King of Belgium, the King of Norway, the Queen of Netherlands, the Shah of Iran, the King and Queen of Thailand, and the Emperor of Japan. All right. And... Uh, uh, the day that they returned uh, from uh, their, their uh, tour uh, was November 5th, 1969. 27 cities in 24 countries in 39 days. All right. So that uh, they had little time off. And these pictures give you a sense of the head spinning pace of the tour and the incredible outpouring of of uh, uh and curiosity from people uh they uh there was over uh, uh a million people uh that that came uh, to see them in thailand uh just record setting everywhere they went attendances but the day they returned uh, to edwards air force base outside of washington dc on november 5th 1969 they were flown by helicopter to the lawn to the White House where they had dinner with President Nixon and the First Lady and spent their first night back as guests of the Nixons in the White House. So, um, Andrews Air Force Base, has that been renamed Reagan, Marty? Yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, okay, so there it's is a, Air Force, still an Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington there. Okay. Well, we thought we'd end this Stay Curious um uh, look back at the hoopla of Apollo 11 with uh, I watched an interesting biography of the man Neil, Ar Neil Armstrong uh, who uh, after his career taught aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati when the kids showed up for their class he bluntly told them yes I am the man who walked on the moon and if you come up and ask me about it or want an autograph or ever have your parents come up and ask me about it or want an autograph, you get an F for my class. I will not tolerate that. We're here to learn aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati, not talk about me. And that had to be an interesting, like, 10 years of his life that he did that. Uh, so... Um, but uh, Neil Armstrong was called by, uh, in, in a documentary I saw, he become a a real good friend with uh, uh, somebody in, in the university and then they had a business and and uh, one of the obscure people outside of NASA, of course, you becomes your best friend. And uh, he said that Neil Armstrong was a giant of a man because he did what was right. Nothing more, nothing less. He was known to just be fair and do what was right. 
He liked to drink beer at polka festivals in Ohio that I've been to a few of those. Having grown up in Finley, just 80 miles north of Wapakoneta on Interstate 75 where he grew up. Um, and he was really awesome with comebacks, all right? On, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, in one of the big crowds of uh, women that he talked to, like women Air Force people, I forget what it was. One of the women, two women were sitting there and they, they asked the question, when are you going to take the first woman to the moon, Neil? And his quick comeback was, we welcome them with open arms. <laughs> and then when he was asked seriously by a reporter like Jules Bergman, uh, it wasn't Jules, it was somebody else, though, uh, how they plan to continue a somewhat normal life after walking on the moon and, the, and everything. Aldrin had a little muckety-muck stuff to say, you know, that he'd be just fine. And Neil Armstrong replied, well, that's up to you, meaning the media, as if they were going to be able to report, have a normal life. So uh, his one of his sons, Mark, said uh, he was far from a recluse. He just insulated himself with loyal friends and family. And uh, the son said, thank God social media didn't exist back in 1969. And you could write a letter and just put to Neil Armstrong and just put on it, Neil Armstrong, USA, and he got it. He received thousands of letters that just had Neil Armstrong, USA, written on them there. He liked to play golf. His son said that was one of, that's where they bonded uh, after uh, getting reacquainted with their father, uh, who had very little time for their kids, like all the astronauts did. Watch the movie First Man. You'll appreciate that even more, I think, about because it's about the families. And uh, here's a picture of him uh, just, uh, just a few months before he died at age 82. Uh, from uh, Actually, he died of a malpractice uh, uh, problem uh, uh, with a heart uh, uh, um, uh, bypass in there. And uh, he had heart bypass surgery, and they had problems uh, with the heart pacemaker, and he died of uh, internal bleeding, uh, I believe. And, and uh, that was not a pleasant situation for the University for Cincinnati Hospital there. But he should not have died uh, uh, when he did. Uh, it was a botched medical procedure. Don't sue me on it. It is in the annuals of history there. But uh, looking quite different there, Marty, at age 82. So we hope that you've enjoyed this retrospect look at the aftermath of Apollo 11. Hope that you have had a chance to look at a moon rock like this person looking at a beautiful moon rock. That does look like the moon rock in the Armstrong Museum. I didn't have time to pull up my picture like that of me looking at a half a dozen moon rocks in museums around the world. So uh, will you look up at that moon tonight? And I know you will. All right. Or sometime over the weekend, if it's clear, think about these brave astronauts that pioneered America to fulfill mankind's greatest adventure. It obviously wasn't that easy because nobody's done it since. It's politics. It's the money involved that politicians need to go to the moon and satisfy our taxpaying base. But somebody's going to go back to the moon, all right? And the non-political people seem to be ramping up for it, like China. A dictatorship and so forth. They 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 want to go back to the moon. Russia sometimes says they're they're going back to the moon. Uh, uh, manned. They've they've had unmanned missions go back there. So, why don't you look up the moon and just say a prayer and thank you for all of the people like Marty Winkle and the 500,000 Americans. Hopefully, you know some of them that took part in this this incredible three year period when. Uh, America did uh, prove to the entire world that our superiority in technological achievements for the betterment of the entire world and humanity. So with that, Marty, I'm going to, you gave me a list of people watching today, and um, Tommy Usak was watching. We've got the Angela Habib is watching, Carrie Fink, Cliff Watson. Hope you enjoyed that, Cliff. Bill Whiting, thank you today. Uh, Bill's on fire with the American Space Museum, and we, we need great volunteers like Bill here. Uh, Peggy Holbert's watching. Uh, Pam Shivick, hope you enjoyed uh, 
some of my uh, uh, Apollo 11 uh, retrospective there, Lisa Zarantz. I said hi to Cliff Watson because in Cliff's in Pomona, Australia. And uh, uh, you come here to the United States and we'll talk about that movie, The Dish, there. Christopher Mix watching, Travis White, Gary Gerald, Jamie Grange. You're not looking at today's. Okay. Well, I got today's mixed up then, Marty. Maybe I put a date on them there. All those people have been watching. It's on the floor behind me. Okay. You get, he, Marty just wanted to see my bald spot. Challenge Zan's watching. Tom Celentano. Patricia Williams. Hey, Patricia. I hadn't seen your name pop up in a while. Space Monkey. Carlton Bailey. Joel Jacobs. Fairville Harley. Tom UCX watching today. So, wanted to just thank everybody that they uh, take the time to watch Stay Curious. As I'll go out one more time saying... That uh, we're so grateful for everybody involved with the Apollo program. It's my personal uh, honor to have known a lot of these people, like Marty, like Lee Sala, the engine guy, like Bob Seek, uh, uh, Charlie Mars. So many of our people here at the American Space Museum were uh, involved with the Apollo program, and we have interviewed them uh, several times. So I uh, hope that you all will... Again, look up at the moon and just have some thoughts about we need to go back there. And then near the moon to the below the moon tonight is going to be the planet Venus. And Mars is in there somewhere, a faint red star that you can't believe how faint it is. And that someday maybe we'll go there. So until next week, we have put episode 855 in the bag, talking about one of my favorite things, the moon. So go out. This weekend, enjoy the moon. It, remember, moonshine is the kind that you can't get too much of. Until next week, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Where's my, mag my newspaper there? Yes, sirree.